Man, I appreciate you guys coming out for our bi-weekly free seminars we do here at Lake Fork Marina. We're going to talk to you guys about a little bit of a uh, transitioning fish. You know, we had it cool down last weekend at the end of the weekend there. And the first part of the week was cool. It changed the fish's behavior, sure enough. I mean, it really did. Uh, but now we're getting hot again, you know, and I'm sure we'll have another cool front at some point, like always. Uh, but it, we're about to that time of year where it's going to get hot and stay hot. And so these fish have kind of changed and adapted with the weather, and they're, and they're in the process of transitioning into their summertime patterns, so to speak, homes, whatever you want to call it. So tonight we're going to talk to you about, you know, spring to summer transition, how to catch them when they're in between, and really dial in on what you can focus on once they get out there. Because while they're transitioning, it's going to be a hit and miss game a little bit for you, me, and everybody in between. You'll have them one day, and the next day you might miss them a little bit. They're kind of spread out. You catch one or two here, one or two there. But once we get to summer, it'll be, if you can find them and put the right bait in there, you'll be able to catch a bunch of them and, and really tee off on them. The summer bite. If you can figure it out, not everybody can figure it out. A lot of people struggle in summer. I mean, I get it, they do. But if you get the summer bite right, it's one of the best bites of the year. I mean, it is, once you get summertime fish located and get them biting, they feed more aggressively and more often in the summer than they do the rest of the year because their metabolism's at the highest. So that summer bite, if you wanna come fish Lake Fork when it's fun, but it's a challenge, but it's fun, Get out here in a hot, hot, hot summertime, June, July, August. Um, and if you can figure it out, it will reward you. And this lake will show you some stuff like you don't normally see. Like pull up on the right area, find these fish, and you catch five pounder, six pounder, eight pounder, four pounder, six pounder. I mean, you'll sit there and make some of these elite guys look like they didn't know what they were doing last week when that summer bite gets going. It just gets so good when you can find one of those schools active. But right now, we've had a uh, kind of an odd weather pattern, right? We went from 90-something degrees on Saturday last weekend to in the 60s for a high the next day. It's pretty extreme weather change. And I don't know how much it affected the water tip on Sunday. I did not fish. I didn't have my graphs on when I was out here watching the Elite Series guys. But I know Monday the water temp had dropped significantly by Monday morning. And Tuesday morning it had dropped, and Wednesday morning it was still low Wednesday morning. So um, I'll tell you what, now I'm not always the best, and I think somebody looking for one of y'all down there, hollering for daddy. Vic, you're the number one suspect, Vic. I'm out this time. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm, yeah. I started talking, now he's talking back. That's what he does. That's what he does. But no. I think when you fish the same lake every day, right, and you go out there and you're like, well, I caught them here, 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 here. Well, it's really, really hard, guys, whether the weather changes or not. It's really difficult to know you had these four or five schools of fish offshore that you'd caught, you know, some good fish out of, caught a big bag of fish out of. Even if you're only catching one to three fish out of the school, man, at the end of the day, you catch 25, 30, 35 pounds. It's almost impossible mentally to not go back and run that water the next day. That is insanely difficult. The best thing that happened to me in this weather change was the Elite Series was going on and I wasn't out there fishing every day. Because what that allowed me to do was have a fresh mind going into Monday because I didn't fish the lake for four days. But also what it allowed me to do is observe a bunch of guys that are really good fishing the lake on live coverage. And what I noticed on Sunday, and I don't know how many of you guys noticed this, was when that cool front blew in, and it got cold, that shallow water gets affected the most. And if you looked at, if it was a one-day tournament on Sunday, the guys that fished the shallowest would have won the would have won the one-day tournament. Yeah, Lee Livesey won the event over four days. But just on Sunday, there was guys catching 27, 28 pounds, and Lee had to catch that 8-pounder on his last cast to get to, I think, 25, I think it was. I mean, he kind of struggled. We all saw most of the day he grinded, grinded, struggled. So what it told me was that those fish, there's not a whole lot of them offshore yet, even going into the tournament. They were just starting to get out there. There wasn't real big groups out there for the most part. There's a lot of fish that are in between that haven't transitioned out offshore yet. For those fish, you get a cool front and they're still close to shallow water, well, they just run up shallow. And, and it's still the same structure, still main lake points. Anytime you got fish transitioning, 
two types of structure, bottom contour, that you need to focus on. Creek channel swings and points. And if you can have both, like a creek channel swing up next to a point, <coughs> even better. But those are the two main transition stop signs that I look for, whether it's fall to winter, winter to spring, spring to summer, or summer to fall. Whenever those fish spread out and start moving locations and moving patterns, changing their seasonal patterns, points and creek channel swings are the key stop sign features that you want to locate. What do, what do points and creek channel swings have in common? Depth changes, right? They're all, a, they're all over the lake. There, there's points and creek channel swings all over the lake. But they have depth changes, sudden depth changes, where these fish can move shallower to deeper, easier without expending as much energy and they're good places for fish to feed when those fish can sit on the edge of a creek channel bit and sit right here and anytime bait rolls over the edge of that creek channel boom they get it those fish can sit on that point and anytime something rolls up over it boom they can eat it they're great ambush spots so they're great feeding spots so they stop there when they're moving around and they allow deep to shallow access very quickly which is also what those fish want when the water temps are changing right is that water temp changes rapidly those fish want to be able to go shallow or deeper when they feel like it. So those are the two kind of structures that we key in on during transition times. Now what we were able to do Monday morning was I just went back to the patterns we were running before the fish transitioned out, which if you weren't looking for bed fish, which there's not enough of those to go look for anymore, really, um, you were fishing shallow points. That's what we we're all fishing, shallow main lake secondary points. Being the time of year it is, I focus more on the main lake points. But every fish I caught Monday, except for just a couple that we did catch out deep, we, later in the day we, li we did go offshore and catch two fish offshore. But other than that, every fish we caught Monday, we had a good day Monday, was, I mean, guys in the dirt, in a shallow point. But the key thing was, it was where those fish had been spawning, it was the points at the mouth of it. So whether you had a small main lake pocket or a whole creek arm, Wherever they had been spawning, you find a point at the mouth of that, those fish were pulled up on those points, stop sign point, and feeding very shallow in that cool weather, cloudy weather, Monday morning. Now, the funny thing was, I think, you know, we overthink things a lot in this sport, right? I think we, we all overanalyze. We're all sitting here trying to figure out how to catch the next bass. I mean, what we do is pretty stupid. Y'all realize that? Like, we're a bunch of idiots. Like, we're literally going out there trying to make an animal eat plastic and metal every day. I guess pretty dumb what we do. And, and they're pretty dumb, right? Like, if you ever eaten a plastic hot dog or a metal hamburger, they do it every day or we wouldn't be here, guys. You know? So, so they're pretty dumb. And I think in that aspect, because it is such an outlandish idea what we're doing as bass fishermen, it's a little tricky at times. We don't understand that world under the water all the time. I think we overthink things. We try to well, that fish ain't smart. Surely I can outsmart him. And we overanalyze and trick ourselves. So I'd been throwing the big shaky head, straight tail worms, offshore had been one of my main baits. So Monday, instead of retying or tying on a smaller shaky head or a square bill or top water or jerk bait, instead of picking any of that up, first thing I did, just keeping it simple and maybe even being a little lazy, to be honest with you, was I handed my customers the big shaky head three quarter ounce shaggy head with the big, big giant straight tail worms. Guys, they bit that worm in inches of water at times. I mean, I'm surprised the worm wasn't standing up with his tail out of the water, how shallow we were fishing on these points and they were eating it. Like if they were on that point, you threw it up there, you got to bite right away. I mean, we started on first point, caught three or four, went to the next point, caught five or six, went to the next point, caught another three or four. I mean, it was just automatic. And I don't know that I've ever in my life thrown the big worm, the big sta stand up, you know, shaky head with a big straight tail worm in that shallow of water. I don't think that I ever have. And it really wasn't horrible windy money where I needed to be throwing a heavy weight up there to feel it. Uh, I literally just had it tied on from the last week when we were fishing offshore. I said, here, fire that up there, you know? And he did. And we ended up throwing it all day and it caught most of the fish. Carolina rig caught a couple, but it caught most of them. So. I think sometimes we overthink it. If there's fish out there in 20 foot biting that big shaky head, there might be some pair in one foot biting that big shaky head. Just if they're biting it and it looks good to them right now, keep throwing it. Don't, don't overthink it.
But that was a deal that I was really proud of. Now, like I said, I got to cheat a little bit because I got to watch the Bassmaster guys fish those cold conditions on Sunday, and I noticed that the shallow water guys actually outcaught the deep water guys. So that's the only reason, to be fair and honest here, I had fished 90 degree weather for 10 days in a row leading up to the Bassmaster tournament. Then I didn't fish for four days. I would have 100% turned my electronics on and went wandering around offshore, grabbing fish, going, where'd they go? Where'd they go? That's what I would have done if it wouldn't have been for that tournament. But it was just, it was kind of eye-opening and a lesson to me that, man, we need to keep our eyes open to today, to, to today's conditions. When we, especially, especially when we get in these transition periods, when these fish are moving from spring to summer, summer to fall, whatever it is. Um, if it's cloudy and windy and colder than it has been and those water temps are cooling and you know they're cooling, fish that, right? Fish those conditions. If the water temp's been 80 and it's cooling back down towards 70, man, that's a good shallow water temperature. They're probably going to migrate up to that some, you know? Uh, same thing vice versa. If it's been cool and then all of a sudden it gets hot, they're going to start pulling out on a day like today where it's slick and hot, you know? Those fish are going to start making their way back out. And it doesn't always happen as immediate as it happened in this deal, but the situation was we had fish in all situations of the water column because they hadn't all transitioned out yet. So with that being said, that just put a lot of them up shallow. Is that, is that making sense? Is that You guys understand what I'm saying? Like, There's a lot of value in that to me that I noticed on Monday was just fishing the day. And I probably wouldn't have done it nearly as good as I did Monday if I didn't get to watch some of the best anglers in the world. And some of them, Brandon Paul and it, not do it very well. Stick with that offshore deal. And, you know, 17 pounds ain't bad. But in that tournament, 17 pounds was bad. And he'd been averaging upper 20s every day. And then he goes out and catches 17. Dude, he stuck with that offshore deal probably too much. In fact... If Lee or any of those other guys, Gerald, any of those other guys, if they would have adjusted and went to shallow points, they probably would have had a better day than what they had, even though they caught them. You know, Lee caught them pretty good. You know what I mean? So they would have got a lot better bites earlier on in the day, for sure, as we saw with uh, Frazier and LaHue and some of those guys that were doing that. So I thought it was a really cool lesson. So that's the first thing I want to talk to you about. Second thing is, with the transition, as these fish begin to get offshore, there's still some out there. Not a lot, but there's definitely still some out there. When I'm graphing this week, when I go out offshore, compared to last week, last week I wasn't seeing big schools, but the fish I saw were actually grouping up. You know, you would when you saw one, you would see three or four or six or eight. Uh, this week, you're seeing a fish up in 10 foot of water on the point and a two fish in 12 foot of water, 15 foot of water, and one fish in 20 foot of water. So let's keep that in mind as we deal with this transition that those fish are not all in the same depth zone and they're not all grouped. So what does that tell us as anglers? That we are going to have to fish these main lake structures as areas, not spots. I think a lot of time on offshore structure, we go up there and we graph a school of fish and we throw at that school and we change baits and throw different baits at that school and we keep making that same general cast, maybe a little bit in there, but you pretty much stay on spot lock these days and fan cast into that school with different baits. Everybody do that? That's pretty much what everybody does, right? Right now, you need to open your mind. You need to graph the whole point, mark everywhere you're seeing fish, and then within those areas that you've marked fish, you need to fish that whole area. No different than if you were going into a cove to fish a cove. You wouldn't just go in there and make one cast of that creek bend in that cove, would you? No, you'd fish around the whole cove. Fish get in there, spring and spread out that cove, right? Same thing on these main lake structures, road beds, uh, points, whatever it is that you're fishing offshore. Those fish are spread out water transitioning. So fish the thing, fish the structure like an area. Don't get caught up in fishing. Well, I saw more fish here than I did there. Because it's not going to be a deal right now where you're going to make that one cast and catch every fish that wants to eat right there. A lot of times it's going to be a deal where you're going to pick one up over here, pick one up over here, pick one up over here. So fish it accordingly. As we transition into the hotter times and these fish do start to group up, that's when you settle in and you fish the school. You find the school, you find where the densest concentration of fish is, and you fish right there. Because even once those break up, there's going to be more gathered. They're gathering on that spot for a reason. They're going to come back to that spot. Does that make sense to everybody?
Okay. All right, let's talk about some baits. I pulled some baits from downstairs to show you guys right now because these baits will work right now, okay? But they will work. The Every bait that I'm fixing to show you will get you bit. If you get them around fish that are ready to eat, they'll get bit from now until the end of August. So you can go buy you some of these baits and you, you know that if you tie these baits on and go fish Lake Fork and I get around fishing or feeding, I'll catch them on these baits right here, okay? First one is the one I've been talking about the most. It's been the best bait in my boat. It's the big shaky head. This is a big six inch shaky head. It's five eighths ounce. It's got a seven odd hook. They've got like a three quarter or seven eighths ounce one that's got a 10 odd hook. Man, I think a 10 odd hook, I mean, if you wanted to fish it, yeah, you could. That's almost a little much. You know, seven aught's plenty big for me. And five eighths ounce, honestly, is heavy enough to feel it in just about any wind you want to throw it in if we're being realistic. Um, but you guys can buy these here. Everything that I have, I pulled from the shelf downstairs. So I'll pass these around, but if y'all want to keep them, you got to go down the register and pay for them. <laughs> They're not mine. They belong to Lake Fork Marina. But five eighths ounce shaky head, if you're not going to buy them here, if you're watching online, you can also buy this at sixcentsfishing.com. Many of the baits, I think everything except for these worms is available at sixcentsfishing.com. When you do, be sure you use the code your Lake Fork Guide. You'll save 10% on all orders. If y'all want to order anything from there, same thing for y'all too. Uh, but this smash tech worm, I just shot an instructional video on this worm and what makes it so special. When you're looking at big straight tail worms, you can watch that video next week and see everything that I explain on it. But I'll just tell you guys, that will get bit more than any other straight tail worm on the market. Straight up. Like I fished them all. Back in the day, they didn't have, like a lot of companies weren't making them, not near as many as there is now. I would throw the Zoom Magnum Trick Worm, which is probably considered to be the most popular one across the country. I'm telling you guys, that's a better mousetrap right there. The deal is no salt. No salt adds more buoyancy to the bait. It makes the bait stand up better, gives it a better action. You can fish it slower, and it still has action down there, rocking around in the current. And also, it makes it more durable. It lasts longer. You're not changing baits out as much. Okay? So th this is the deal on big straight tail worms is the Smash Tech. Magnum Crawler, a.k.a. Big Power. Big Power? <laughs> Anybody seen Friday? Yeah, the rest of Friday? Huh? Y'all can laugh. It's okay. Y'all can interact a little bit. Y'all ain't got to all sit there and stare at it. I feel kind of weird right now. Now we got some smiles. Now we rolling. Now we rolling. Yeah. You're supposed to be the leader of the laugh patrol over here. Oh, yeah. What are you doing? You got my bait. See, he knows. He's got a package of them, too, he's going to buy. I ran out today. What color? Oh, uh, what color? So there's actually color. They're out of stock on this color down there, but there's a color called Fake Out that's different. That's been the best color for me. It's a weird color. You hold it in your hand, it looks kind of light brown colored. You hold it in the sky, it looks pink and purple. I've just started calling it old Panky. 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 Old Panky. Old Panky be doing a stanky leg down there catching them fish. That's what it is. But uh, I don't know. It's a weird looking color, but it's been catching them. But in general, you know, and I go over all this in that video, but dark green, solid green, light green, which that's what this is, watermelon seed. You know, like a translucent green, a solid green and some type of reddish purplish color. Plum apple if you want, June bug if you want. But that right there, those three will get you a bit in any conditions, okay? So don't don't go crazy on colors. Hey, how you doing, hey, Ken? How you doing? If you get you two or three colors of those worms, a solid dark color one, a translucent green color like watermelon seed, and then get a reddish color, a purple color, man, that'll cover any, any basis you, you run into out there conditioning-wise. So we'll pass these around. But like I said, that's the owner right there. Don't be stealing these, y'all. If you want them, you got to go buy them. They're from Lake Ford Marina. <laughs> and he used to be a cop, so he'll get you. He'll get you. Don't hold all that against me. Huh? I ain't going to hold none of that against you. That don't, that don't do nothing but make us love you more. Are you fishing them any other way other than shaking here? I will throw them on a Carolina rig. Again, the buoyancy. But the bait I've been doing better on on a Carolina rig is this one right here. This is the ridge worm, and I'll let you, you guys look at this one, but it's got a very unique tail. Uh-oh, uh-oh. He don't want me telling the secrets. That's what it is. He's upset I'm telling all the good stuff. Y'all see that tail? That's just a weird, flat, weird, I mean, it's an odd-looking bait when I first saw it. But, man, that thing in the water has, like, a swimming action behind it, 
And uh, I've actually been throwing this on a Carolina rig. You can like Texas rig it. We throw it on Texas rig a lot later in the summer. But I've been Carolina rigging this. This is actually... No, don't do that. We were throwing the Impact Shad on the Carolina rig. <laughs> and then they kind of quit buying the Carolina rig. I was just playing around. I put this on a Carolina rig. And, bud, they're, they're biting that. That's my best Carolina rig bait right now. And uh, it's kind of weird that they're on the big worm bite this early this year. Because usually that's a deal... They transition to the big worm bite once it gets a little hotter and more of them get out there. After they get tired of seeing crankbaits and jigs. But for whatever reason, this year, right from the go, they've been on that. And now they're on the ridge worm. Um, they're just on a big worm bite early this year. We'll pass that around as well. But, yeah, you can rig that, like I said, on the Carolina rig. That's been my best Carolina rig bait. I do rig the Magnum Crawler some on a Carolina rig as well. Just to, And it'll pick up a bite here or there. But that one's been better for me. They like, they smash that ridge worm. Speaking of Carolina rigs, I want to show you guys this. This is really neat. This is called a Carolina pre-rig. Now, Everybody knows that Carolina rigs are a giant pain in the rear end to rig up. Three knots, beads, weights, you know, bobber stoppers to protect your knots. I mean, it's just a royal pain to rig up a Carolina rig, right, in the boat on the fly. Well, this Carolina pre-rig comes with two beads, a clacker in the middle of them, a weight, and it's got, you know, your split rings on both ends. And so what I like to do is take these Carolina pre-rigs, and I'll go ahead and rig my leader up on the bottom and tie a hook to it. And you roll it up and put it in a little baggie or put it in an old prescription pill bottle, however you want to store it. You store that somewhere in your boat. So if you go out there and decide, they ain't buying that shaky head, let's try Carolina rig. Well, you simply pull that out of your, your baggie and you tie your knot right there on your top split ring, put you a bait on it and throw it out there. I mean, it's instant how it fits. It just makes you a lot more efficient. So I really like the Carolina pre-rig. It's done a really good job. It's got kind of a flexible wire down the middle. I have not noticed it getting hung up any more or less than a regular Carolina. In fact, it might hang up less than a regular Carolina rig with that flexible wire. Um, it's it's just been a really time saver. And anything saves time in the boat, you're gonna make more casts, gonna make you better. You know, that's right from the Vic. Next is one of my favorites, and I picked you guys at a real good color. This was a color I picked of this jig. I've got a three quarter ounce hybrid jig. Now, we all know what's in the water at Lake Fork: roots, stumps, brush, rock, shell. Just a whole bunch of stuff to grab a football head, basically. Football head jigs are great offshore jigs, but if you're fishing around any kind of timber or root systems or even rough rock or shell, a football jig will hang up a lot worse than a regular jig will. Well, when you take these out of the package and look at them, the bottom of the head has just a little bit of a curve like a football head jig does. So if you want to slow drag it, it'll still kind of rock like a football head jig will as it goes across the bottom, but it's got that triangular head. It's why it's called a hybrid jig. It's like a hybrid of all the jigs you could imagine. And they've just done a really good job with that head design. It is absolutely perfect. But anyway, this color, candy bluegill is the name of this color. It's got some green and some orange and a little bit of bluish purplish sheen to it. Uh, just looks like a little brim or crawfish or whatever. It's just a, it's a good fork color. It's a good East Texas color, period. Candy bluegill is the color jig. And then gill dust is a little different color on the trailer. It's kind of a dark pumpkin seed slash green pumpkin and it's got some orange and purple flake in it matches up with this jig really well so gilda stroker crawl for a trailer three quarter ounce hybrid jig and candy bluegill and i do not trim anything when i'm fishing offshore in the summertime on my jig i want a big profile you guys that follow me know in the wintertime i trim it down make it real short and compact in the summertime i'm leaving the full skirt and i'm leaving the full size stroker crawl trailer on these big jigs out deep so we'll pass those around as well and last but not least, this is the exact bait that we saw Lee Livesey throw in the first couple days, especially catching them on a deep diving crankbait. This is the Crush 300 DD. They have the Cloud 9 series. That's the C20 would be the equivalent to this, or C15, maybe C20, something like that. Uh, let's see what they call for in depth on this one. Yeah, probably, the, well, between the C15 and C20, it got on here, dials 14 and 19. But uh, they make a 500 DD. They got that downstairs as well. That'll be like your 10 XDs. This is going to be like your 6 XD. Uh, but this color shad drone is my personal favorite shad color they make. And this 300 DD crankbait had a big hand in winning that tournament last weekend. And that Cloud 9 series is great. It is great. I've caught a lot of big fish on the Cloud 9, C25, C20, C15, all that. But this 300 and 500 DD series, I don't think anybody really 
very few people are aware of this bait. Because Sixth Sense, when they designed that C C uh, Cloud Cloud Nine series, they kind of didn't market this one as much anymore. This bait right here has caught three or four share lunkers on Sam Rayburn alone. Hey, this is one of the best deep diving crankbaits on the market. This 300 and 500 DD series. I mean, it's, 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 I know all crankbaits are kind of the same. No, this one's a little different. Like big fish bite this crankbait right here. So y'all take a good look at that. Huh? Not, quite as big as like the not as wide. 10 and 20. You know, it's a lot like the old. I don't know if y'all remember. I don't know if y'all remember. There, there used to be a. I think Bomber made old Fat Free Shad. Mm -hmm. Remember that old Fat Free Shad? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that bait, and that was my favorite crankbait before it got discontinued. Mm -hmm. Or I just, you know, after Booyah and all the mergers, I never could find them anymore. But that 300 and 500 DD is pretty similar to that, and it is a big fish catching dude, man. That sucker catches some giants, and it's kind of. Hush, hush, you know. Yeah, that, that shad drone is that color. Now, whether I'm throwing a square bill or a deep diving crankbait, if I want a shad color, shad drone is my favorite six cents shad color. Okay? And like I said, guys, y'all feel free. If y'all want some of these baits, hang on to those right there. Uh, but pay for them at the counter. <laughs> Ken, Ken will arrest you. He'll, he'll go back into duty and arrest you. Uh, but also, there's plenty of these baits, the exact baits that I just pulled off here, it showed you guys downstairs. So you guys can all go buy whatever you want of those tonight. Uh, now, boy, I knocked that out too fast. I went too fast. It's hardly ever been accused of not talking enough, is it? <coughs> not usually what I'm... Not usually... Hush. <laughs> now you laugh. I mean, we were, you were now on time Now you laugh. I mean, I mean, you were I mean, on time today. We actually did start too. on time. So. Well, actually... Oh my, oh, my goodness. Does anybody have any questions real quick? No, no questions. I'm that good, that good of a bass fishing teacher. <laughs> or am I just talking nonsense and y'all ain't interested? I don't know. One little thing. It could go 50-50. You got questions? When these fish are out on these points right now transitioning, you stay right on the shallow, are they, are they on structure? Are they, I mean, like wood or lay downs? Or well, I think they'll use whatever's present, right? So the way that I look at that is I worry about the bottom contours and the bottom content first. <clears throat> And then whatever's there. Some of the points I fish have timber. Some of the points kind of don't. I mean, they may have a little bit, but, but some, some of you know, a lot of points I fish don't really have much timber. But I don't factor in when I'm deciding to fish a point or not. I don't think about timber at all. If it happens to be there, I'll fish it accordingly with the timber that's there. Um, but I don't necessarily need. I worry about the bottom contours. Does that point? The real key deal in all of this is the hard spot. That's the top secret deal, guys, is these really hard, washed out, clean spots that just feel like rock, chunk rock, shell, um, hard clay. You know, it's a little mixture of all that. Some of the points it's rock, some of the points it's shell, um, and a lot of them it's a mixture of both. And <clears throat> But all I can tell you is when you're dragging the big shaky head, when you're dragging a three-quarter ounce jig, when you're dragging a three-quarter, one-ounce Carolina rig, <clears throat> You can absolutely feel the sweet spots if you're paying attention. It feels completely different. You throw off to the side and don't get on the hard spot, it just feels soft the whole way back to the boat. You throw down the spine of the hard stuff and it feels rough. It feels crunchy, rough the whole way back to the boat. Finding those hard spots is the most important thing I think you can do on this lake in the condition it's in with low water. I think that's the most important thing you can do. So hopefully that answers your question. Where they're at and where they're feeding at the best is on these hard spots. Whether it's in one foot of water, 25 foot of water, or anywhere in between. I mean, I, I can't even think of a bite that I've gotten in the last two or three weeks that has not been on a hard spot. I think every one of them. Now, part of that is we're hunting down those hard spots, finding that right angle, and hitting that. You know what I mean? Now, that may run. Now, some of these points... You may have a hard spot from here to the boat ramp. So it's not like they don't have room to roam on these cleaned off spots. Um, some of them are just patches, little, a little hard spot. If I find a point that's just got a little hard spot, that's the only place I'm going to cast. I really won't even hardly waste it. I may fan cast around a little bit looking for another hard spot, 
But if I only have the one hard spot, we'll make our cast there. If we don't get bit, we'll move on. So, does that make sense? Those hard spots are the most important thing you can find. That's where they're setting up now. I was going to ask about how you set up. You talked about that last night. In the video, when you were talking. Go ahead. Ask me. Ask a question because it'll be good for him. I didn't see. Well, it. yeah. How, when you when, after you spot the fish, locate him, whatever mm -hmm. on the points, are you setting up shallow? Casting out to them, or are you setting up deep? Yeah. Casting back out. Yeah. So I know a lot of guys have preference on that. A lot of guys would rather drag uphill. A lot of guys would rather drag downhill. Man, I don't care. I don't care about dragging uphill or or downhill or anything in between. What I care about is how the fish are set up. So, you know, it's no different than if fish are right on the bank and you're fishing by yourself, you, what do you do? You get up there and you parallel the bank, right? Or if fish are on a grass line, you parallel that grass line. Why do we do that? Well, it's to keep our bait in the strike zone for the longest amount of time. If those fish are sitting up on a grass line, you want to keep your bait right on the edge of that grass line. Instead of if the grass line runs here, instead of throwing out here and hit that one little piece of grass line, why not get over here and hit the whole grass line? And you can move faster and cover more, right? Same thing with these schools of fish. When you start marking them out deeper on your electronics, or let's say you're marking one or two here and they're spread out from 10 foot to 20 foot, right? Mark all those fish and then zoom out and look at all those waypoints that you marked from those fish. And if you look at my graph, and you'll see it in some shots when you watch videos of mine, where there's fish waypoint icons all over these points. Well, that's because I go in there and I mark every fish in there. Every, every, even if I see one or two, I'll mark them, you know. And if I see a school, I'll really mark them. You know, I'll put two fish icons on it or whatever. But I'll look at that point, and most of the time, they'll be set up in an elongated fashion. They'll be, you know, up and down the point. You know, the point runs this way, they're sitting up and down on the spine. Or the wind's blowing a certain way, so they're set up, you know, the point runs this way, and they're set up across it or at an angle. But a lot of times there will be kind of an elongated pattern of how those fish are set up. So what I actually like to do is I like to get uh, – on the, if I can, I like to get on the windblown side where I'm throwing with the wind to make it easier on customers to cast. And also when you're dragging back into the wind, that's a lot easier to fill your bait than it is throwing into the wind and dragging back with the wind pushing your line. The wind's pushing against your line. It's going to keep your line tighter. You're going to feel that You're going to feel bites, feel bottom, feel everything better dragging against the wind, so to speak. Um, so let's say I got a school set up like this right here. I'm going to put my boat right here or right here. So that when I make a cast, my bait stays in that school the whole time. Instead of, if they're set up like this, instead of setting up over here, I'm only keeping my bait in the strike zone for that long. If I set up over here, I can keep my bait in the strike zone for that long. Does that make sense? So when I set up, it really depends on how the fish are set up. However they're set up, I want to keep my bait around a fish as much as I can. That's my whole goal. And if I can, I want to throw with the wind. Sometimes they're set up like this and the wind's blowing this way and you just got to throw crosswind. And that sucks. But, <laughs> you know, I still, to me, it's more important to keep my bait in the school than it is to fish the wind or the point right. It's all about keeping my bait around those fish. Good question. Really good question and really important. You know, I tell customers all the time, we'll be graphing, graphing, graphing. I'll get it all marked. I'll get up there on the trolling myself. Don't make any cash yet. Hold on. We got to get set up right. Boat positioning on offshore fish is one of the most important parts of offshore fishing is your boat position. Stay, staying off of them, not getting on top of them, you know, making a long cast to them so that you're further away from them. You know, all this boat positioning stuff, it used to be the guys that were really good offshore fishermen were masters at boat control and positioning before spot lock days. Now we can all kind of be masters at boat positioning because of spot lock, really. You know, everybody got spot lock? I think most people, you don't? I don't have a boat. You don't have a boat? Okay. <laughs> right. Well, who, whoever's boat you fish in, do they have spot lock? I don't even, I fish, I fish out here off the bank. Fish off the bank? Yep. My man's going hard at it. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Have you been catching them off the bank? Uh, Since that cold front hit. Yeah. I kind of quit. I fish that 154 bridge a lot. Yeah. Um, like fishing out deep. You know, there is some fish on bridge aprons right now on the corners. Yeah, we've been I, catching some around those in some of some of the you know main lake bridges and even the creek arm bridge. We saw Mullins fishing over there in Little Mustang in the Bass mm -hmm. tournament. I've been fishing it a little bit here and there. Yeah. I've seen some other guys fishing it. So, you know that that's probably a new bank fish out here. I, I used to get asked quite a bit. I haven't been asked every once in a while. I still get asked, but used to get asked a lot. People ask me, "What's your advice to bank fish Lake Fork?" 
And my answer was always the best thing to do is to go to the bridges and just park on the side of the road and walk down the, the bridge apron and fish those corners and those concrete walls on the bridges. I mean, it's most of the year there's going to be something there. Something. I was fishing the bridge in Running Creek, that old submerged bridge. Uh -huh. I was walking out there on top of it. Yeah. I've seen a lot of guys. That, so how do you get to the bridge? You I'm just trespassing? No, it's it's a it's I mean it's a public lake, so I just walk down the. Oh, lake. you walk down the lake bed. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, a lot. Yeah. That's true. You can just walk down the lake bed. See, so in I my head, for whatever reason, down it one day. in my head, for whatever reason, I was like, man, are these guys walking through the woods of that private property no. over there? What are they <laughs> doing? Because I would see some guys out on that bridge fishing from it. Yeah. And for those that don't know what we're talking about, there's there's an old underwater bridge that, with the lake being five and a half foot low, is like ankle deep water on top of it right now. Is that correct? Yeah, the first, first time I went out there, it was, I think the water was 44 degrees, and I just kind of took my boots off and walked out there. <laughs> I caught one bass, and I was like, I need to go give me some water boots. Yeah, yeah. So it was just had a little bit of water on top, so guys were actually standing, when you drive by that bridge, guys were standing on top of this old bridge that was just under the surface, fishing. Let me ask you, is there a hole in the middle of it? So the, yeah, it, look, it looks like they hammered um, holes in the deck, so that way when the lake filled up, it didn't trap that air in there and pick the bridge up. Okay. So that everybody was crappie fishing out of there. So, it was like ice fishing. Bro, Texas. I was so confused <laughs> one day, like in the pre-spawn period or whatever. I went by there, and there was a bunch of dudes on that, you know, a bunch of folks on that bridge fishing off the edges of it. And everybody's kind of fishing off, you know, outside the edge, of, standing on the edge, fishing over with their pole. And as I'm idling by that, kind of just checking them out, seeing what they're doing. Man, this guy that's standing slap in the middle of the bridge sets the hook. And I'm like, dude, there's that much water on top of the bridge. And he pulls out a big old crappie. And I'm like, did he just catch the crappie off the top of that bridge? And that was, well, they're walking around them? Like, what the hell? I, I can't, for the life of me, couldn't understand. I, and I just got to thinking. I was like, there's got to be a hole in there. Like, at first, my mom was going, "That there's a crappie swimming around their feet up there, dude. Like, what the hell? Because he was just sitting there, he goes, Ping, and had a crappie. I was like, whoa. Blew my mind. Blew my mind. So when you're fishing all these baits, do you change line at all? Size, color? Ooh, let's see. Every bait that we gave you tonight. Yeah, the crankbait line is going to be different. Um, on the big shaky head, the Carolina rig, and the big jig, all of that can be 20-pound fluorocarbon is what I use. You know, 99.999% of the time, especially out here, 20 pound floor um, On the crankbait, I do go down to 17 and even 15 just to get it, you know, if I want to get it a little deeper. There are times when I'll tie a crankbait rod on a rod that has 20 pound on it uh, to keep it from going as deep. So if I only want that bait to run 12 foot, tie it on 20 pound tail. It'll only run 12 to 14 foot instead of 14 to 19. Or, you know, that 14 to 19, there's a big variant. That thing on 15-pound test will probably run about 16, 17 foot, right? You go down to 10-pound test, it'll get down to 19, maybe even 20, but probably about 19. But if you throw it on 20-pound test, it's only going to run about 12, 13 foot. So if I wanted it to only run 12 or 13 foot, then I'd put it on 20-pound test. But that's the deal with the crankbait. You can play with line size and get it deeper or shallower. Um, but all those other baits, just big line, man, out here. Those are big, heavy baits. You're fishing around heavy cover and timber a lot, and you got big bass. You want to take control of them. What else? That's a good question. See, y'all slow played me talking about like we ain't had no questions. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Now y'all answer. Y'all asking some really good questions. So I fish a lot of braid. Um, okay. Thirty pound P line. Kept on braid. I switched over from mono. Okay. Um, Oh, we together. We always go back and forth and catch more on mono or more on braid. The P-line braid's about 8-pound diameter. Yeah, it's real thin, I know. It, 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 what kind of rod are you fishing that 30-pound braid on? Uh, Temple Fork, 7.76. Like, medium how? Heavy. Medium heavy? Mm -hmm. You don't have any break-off issues on 30-pound braid on a medium heavy rod? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would, I would probably have break-off issues. I would maybe I don't know maybe I just pull on too hard I winch my drag all the way down you know because I want to set the hook in them real hard and get the hook in them good especially when I'm fishing these baits that we're talking about tonight that have bigger hooks in them um, there's a place for 30 pound braid I, I like using it on a on a chatter bait and a swim jig at times in grass but I'm using it on a more bendy flexible rod when I'm doing that um, Fast tip on it, but it's, yeah. it's still seven. Man, I'm gonna be honest with you, I do not, I personally am not a fan of braid, braided line 
unless I'm fishing around vegetation. If I'm fishing rock, is like a hot knife through butter on braid when you get around rock. Rock will cut through braid like that. Um, if you're dragging baits through it, you know what I mean? Uh, in timber with braid, it'll actually, when you're dragging, let's say you're dragging a three quarter ounce <coughs> jig and you get over a limb, a lot of times when that gets in that crevice of that limb, that braid will cut a groove in that tree that makes you hang up a lot more. I find, I find I get hung up a lot more on braid and then with no stretching braid at all, it's a lot harder to get that bait to come undone, you know, plucking the line, however you like to do it. It's a lot harder to get that bait to come undone when I use braid. So, and in the back of my mind, I don't know if this matters at all or not. I really don't. Hell, so half the time I catch fish with a radio on and the boat speaker's vibrating. So I don't know that noise really makes that much difference to them, <clears throat> but it could. And we all hear that sound that braid makes when you reel it. That, that little whistling sound, wispy sound it makes. When I'm dragging over trees, it down there going when I'm dragging around a root or, or the base of a tree or something, is it making noise down there? I don't know. But in my head, that's kind of another reason why yeah, I lean away from braid. Mainly the getting hung up worse deal is the big problem. Getting hung up and staying hung up worse. And that's why I don't really use braid. Now, <clears throat> I don't like to use mono when I'm fishing these baits because you got so much line out. We're making really long cast offshore. We got big hooks. You don't need a bunch of, like when you set the hook on a mono bait with that, you know, with a big fish and you got that much line out and it feels like a rubber band. You can literally feel the stretch as you're setting the hook. I just don't feel like you get the hook in them near as good. Fluorocarbon doesn't have nearly as much stretch as mono. It does have some, but not nearly as much as mono. And that's why, I, and it doesn't get hung up as bad as braid. That's why I use fluorocarbon line. That's my reasoning behind it. But if you're using 30 pound braid and it's working for you and you're not having hang up issues and you're not having break off issues, brother, you do you. Man, the, the, no one way to do it in this game, right? Just like we saw in the top 10 with Bassmasters, you had guys fishing main lake structure offshore and stayed that way all four days and a guy won it doing that. And you had guys that were, Gerald's window was fishing like mid depth stuff, eight, 10 foot of water, and he was. Third place went over 100 pounds. And he had guys fishing dirt shallow water for most of the tournament. And they finished in the top 10. So there's never any one rhyme or reason to do anything. You got guys that throw crankbaits on glass rods and guys that throw them on graphite rods. I mean, there's always differing opinions. And at the end of the day, you have to fish what you feel confident in. If for you on the line, it's braid, then it's braid. And that's what you need to fish with. Uh, will a fish, get, will you get more bites using fluorocarbon than braid? I honestly don't think in these waters, I don't think it matters. Now, if you want to talk about going to some really clear water out in California or the Ozarks or somewhere where it's super clear water up north, you know, smallmouth, yeah, the braid versus mono or fluorocarbon deal is going to start making a difference on visibility and number of bites probably. Probably so. But here... Brother, the line size and color, I don't think it makes any difference on the bites you get. That green pea line. Yeah. That one braid, it, it disappears. Dude, they bought an Alabama rig. It's got wires on it. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, if they'll bite a thing full of metal wires, surely they ain't going to mind that little braid, you know? I don't worry about the visibility of line at all. At all. Not a bit. So there's all these different brands of fluorocarbon. Mm -hmm. Which one do you... Which one do you like? So I use Seaguar Red Label more than anything else, but that's because I'm a guide and I'm out there all the time. Uh, it does have worse memory, but it's very strong. It's cheap for fluorocarbon. And it's very strong, great knot strength and all that. It doesn't cut itself in the knot. Some fluorocarbons will do that worse than others, cut itself off at the knot. Uh, when you sense the knot down, you know, then you put pressure on it, snaps right at the knot. Some of them do. Seaguar Red Label is very tough line, very strong, line, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to deal with on your reels. It's a lot easier to deal with when you're fishing every day and you're stretching it every day. But like if I have a rod for a technique that I don't use for a couple months and I pull it out, that red label's a mess. It's a nightmare. It's got so much memory. Uh, probably the best fluorocarbon that I've seen, me personally, and I know everybody loves Invisex and Abrasex and that stuff. Man, Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon. It's a gold label, like a gold tannish color label. Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon. It's high. It's expensive. But it has got great memory qualities and it is very strong very smooth um that's probably the in my opinion the best fluorocarbon that i've used
And I got that right downstairs too because they got everything Berkeley ever made in this store. They host that Berkeley tournament here? Dude, this whole store will be Berkeley in October, y'all. I'll tell you, it's wild how much they got. Yeah. I got away from the floor carpet because of the cost. Because of the cost? I understand. I understand. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, it's a real factor when you, and when you're not fishing all the time, floor carbon kind of goes bad. Floor carbon almost has an expiration date on you. You know what I mean? Like, it ain't like you can just put floor carbon on there and fish a couple times a month and it's good for six months. Now, you pretty much, if you fish a couple times a month, you got to resplit your rod every time, every other time you go out. You know, so it, it is, floor carbon has maintenance issues and it's pain. But when you're fishing all the time, to me, it's the best. For for what you know, we're talking about doing dragging heavy baits offshore. I think it's the best one. What else? Good questions. Hey, that's a maybe a kind of a silly question, but anyway, I'm a saltwater fisherman trying to get into freshwater. Yes, sir. I've only been out here for about a year, but when you're talking about patterns and transitions and all that, uh, you're applying it to this lake, but in general, is that about the same that goes for all the East Texas lakes? Yeah, yeah, you'll find a lot of the lakes in the region will pattern the same, okay? Uh, some lakes will pattern differently. Lake Palestine patterns differently than other lakes because it's primarily a shallow water fishery. Um, there is some offshore fish and stuff like that. Uh, Tawakening, same thing. Primarily a shallow water fishery. There is offshore fish, and those offshore fish will react and behave the same way that we're talking about with Fort Bass. But there's so many fish that live year-round. There's so much shallow water on those two lakes. They're flat. That there's so many fish, such a big percentage of the population, that lives their whole life shallow. And so they, they have different, you know, little unique things that they do. Normally when this lake's full, we have a phenomenal population of shallow fish year-round as well because we have vegetation in the lake, whether it's flooded shoreline vegetation or the, the areas that we do actually have hydrilla and coontail in you will have residential year-round shallow fish in those areas. And those fish will behave differently. They do behave differently, but it's funny how many things are similar. Like, they still go offshore in the summer. They just go offshore shallow. And they find the deepest water, and they find, like, well, if you have a creek channel bend going like this, on the inside bend, what's that make? Point, right? So they get they literally when these fish get on points out on the main lake, them ones up shallow are on a point in a grass flat right there, you know. So it's kind of funny how they have similarities like that. But uh, no, it, it's different on other lakes that have more shallow water dynamics to it. Um, but no, for the most part, when we're it, offshore fish are all going to behave roughly the same way in this region. They're all reacting to the same weather patterns. Um, there'll be little differences from lake to lake on baits they'll buy. You know, depending on what their what their forage base is in that lake or what the water color is in that lake, may be a little different. Like Lake Athens is a much clearer lake than Lake Fork, so uh, you have to downsize some of your baits at Lake Athens. Even though it has big bait and big fish, I find I have to downsize at Lake Athens more than I do here because of the cleaner water. Um, so there's little things that are different, but in general, as far as the fish patterning, what they're setting up on, how they're setting up, if you're talking about offshore fish on one lake to the next, it's pretty much the same. And the smaller lakes, everything will happen faster. So when they transition offshore, they'll, they'll do it faster. When they spawn, they'll do it faster. When you get a cold front, they move back shallow, they'll do it faster. The, there's more, the smaller the water body is, the greater the temperature swings in the water column. So the bigger the swings are on their behavior. I was up in Long Branch yesterday fishing, and I was talking to a guy that lives up there. He's out there on his pier. Mm -hmm. And asking how we're doing this and that. And then he said, you know what, I was out here, uh, Fry out yesterday. They were stocking it. Sherlock and fry. Yeah. Yeah, it's been that it's that time of year, you know. Tex Parks of My Life is uh the think without any grass cover they're gonna last very long. I mean what can they do? Get eaten. <laughs> I mean what what can Tex Parks of My Life they do? Not put them in? Yeah. I mean some will survive. Some will survive, yeah. How many will survive? I mean in in a regular situation, I've talked to the biologists in this area about this. In a regular situation, the fry survival rate is so low. It, and it has to be. Yeah. I mean, a 10-pound bass lays up to 50,000 eggs. For every 10-pound, y'all know how many 10-pounders are out there in that lake? There's a bunch, There's a lot of 10-pounders out there. So we're talking about millions of babies born every year in this lake. Well, if most of them didn't die, we'd have a bunch of short, stunted fish. Right. You know what I mean? So, yes, the fry survival rate is much better when there's flooded cover. We've been lucky for, oh, since, what, 2015, I think? 
we've had a full lake during the spawn every year since 2015. Mm -hmm. So our fry recruitment, our fry survival has been very, very good. And our stocking survival has been very good during that time. Uh, yeah, this is going to hurt the fry survival rate with the lake being low. It's going to, you know, it's going to hurt the ones that were born in this lake just as much as it is the ones that are stocking. Now, the ones that are stocking are a little bit bigger, so they got a little better chance. They got a little better chance, right? Uh, the, the fingerlings, they're stocking fingerlings, not fry. Right, yeah. Fry is what gets decimated because everything eats fry. Bluegill, turtles, I mean, everything eats fry, right? Fingerlings, a bluegill ain't going to eat a fingerling. Even sand bass can't really decimate fingerlings the way they can fry, okay? So that helps some. But like you said, these guys are going to Long Branch to dump these fish. Long Branch has got as much timber in it as anywhere on the lake does. It's thick with timber. So our Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is doing the best they can to put these fingerlings, these share lunker offspring, in areas that they can survive. Does everybody know about their program with stocking share lunker fry or fingerlings? Everybody knows about that? Hopefully all you online do too. I'm sure some of you won't. If not, look up the Texas Parks and Wildlife share lunker program. Read up on it. It's why Texas is the best bass fishing state in the country. And I don't know why other states aren't doing it yet. Probably funding, I guess, in other states maybe. But other states should be doing things a lot more like Texas Park Wildlife does. Because we are. We, mean, we are the crown jewel of bass fishing in the country. Texas has become that. You know, it used to be Florida for a little while. California was Trophy Bass Evan. But Texas has taken over, man. The consistency of the tournament weights that come out of Texas lakes is just unlike anywhere else. You know, they come to Lake Fork. It doesn't matter if it floods. It doesn't matter if it's fall. It doesn't matter if a cold front hits. It doesn't matter... What's the lake's low, the lake's full, turnover? It doesn't matter. The professional tour level guys show up here and they can weigh all the slot fish in the boat. It's 100 pounds. Okay. Guys, it's the only place in the history of the sport that's done that. We realize that? This lake is the only place in the history of the sport that it's over 100 pounds every time they hold a four day professional event. Gunnersville's taken under 100. Santee Cooper's taken under 100. Okeechobee's taken way under 100 at times. Clear Lake's taken under, they've all taken under 100, except for Lake Fork. You fish a four-day event on Lake Fork, you're going over 100 pounds every time, no matter what. No matter what. So, it's unbelievable the job Texas Parks and Wildlife's done. It really is. They, they deserve an immense amount of credit for what we get to enjoy throughout the state. Throughout the state. Yeah. What else? Texas Parks and Wildlife ought to pay me for that plug. I'll tell you what. <laughs> We're accepting sponsorships, boys. I'm just saying. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Hey, uh, everybody, you buying those? Not all of them, no. Not all of them? Okay. <laughs> he does have them all over He's got them all, doesn't he? He's got them all. It's time to go. Here, I'll all right. You. you can buy them. Anybody wanna, if y'all want to buy these ones that I picked out, just let me know. I'll hand them to you. If not, I'm going to put them back on the shelf. And then y'all can just pick what you want from there. But uh, please do go support Lake Fork Marina and support Six Cents. Six Cents does so much to support what we do at your Lake Fork Guide. I appreciate you buying their products. Smash Tech as well, same thing. But really, go buy these baits right here at Lake Fork Marina. Show them some love. Spend some money with them because, I mean, look, they give us their free run of their facility every two weeks to do this. Provides an opportunity for, for us to talk fishing and hopefully for some of you guys to, to learn. And hopefully catch more and bigger fish because that's what it's all about, right? So, so we you're, really. You're alive right now.